Um, I'm going to start out with just a little bit of an overview of what's going on at the border very quickly. I'm the bearer of bad news and then we're going to switch to Emily and she's going to talk about all the amazing wildlife that we are seeing um, living along the border. I think hopefully Emily's PowerPoint is a willing participant now. <laughs> Almost there. Okay. Technology is always fun. <laughs> it is. Always. So um, for those of you who've been following our coffee break series, um, we don't actually have the next one scheduled, um, but we've been doing these regularly every, every um, other Thursday. So we will um, be scheduling additional coffee breaks on topics um, related to our work and um, our partners we're working with and wonderful, um, the wonderful ecology of the Sky Islands. All right, well, let me just uh, kick us off with a little intro about what is going on right now uh, with, with border wall construction. So over the past months, Arizona, uh, the, the Sky Island region of Arizona, but really all of Arizona and especially public lands have become really the epicenter for border wall construction. And this construction is continuing outside the rule of law. The Trump administration has waived dozens of laws to expedite this construction through what are really our national treasures here along the US-Mexico border. Um, right here in the Sky Island region, border wall construction has been ongoing at the San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge, where portions of the refuge are being destroyed. And the water that sustains the endangered fish that live here is being pumped out from under them to create concrete for the wall. And here uh, at this next slide is a closer look at the construction on the ground of this 30 foot wall that's going up through a national wildlife refuge. Uh, also in just the past weeks, um, concrete has been poured in a, a trench dug across the San Pedro River and concrete poured um, this is in the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area, and you can see what um, the border looks like here. I was just there this spring. It's a photo I took walking this stretch of the river, and the um, trench and concrete pouring that's going on there now. Um, this was the last free-flowing river in the desert southwest, so this is a really devastating um, turn of events. And then here on the next slide is another look just at the enormity of this trench and um, the construction that's occurring across this very special border. And then finally, uh, construction began Monday um, in the Coronado National Memorial on this next slide, um, where the southernmost two miles of the Arizona Trail have been closed, the Arizona National Scenic Trail and heavy equipment is already on site. Um, so this is a look at wall that is already in place on the Coronado National Memorial. And you can see um, if you follow the wall up to where the mountains are really rising up that the wall ends there. So they're going to build through these rugged mountains here, um, destroying the last, the last um, couple miles of the Arizona Trail and really important uh, wildlife habitat. So, a tremendous amount of damage is being done to these special places um, in the Sky Islands and many other special places in Arizona. Um, but in a, a small bit of good news, um, segments of construction in the Sky Island region, including these we're looking at, have been funded by money that's now uh, been deemed to be taken illegally from the Department of Defense budget. In June, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit ruled that President Trump's attempt to circumvent Congress and transfer $2.5 billion in military funds for wall construction is unlawful, which is um, an excellent finding. Um, unfortunately, uh, construction continues. Um, but yesterday, that is uh, being addressed. Yesterday, the Sierra Club, ACLU, and Southern uh, Borders uh, Communities Coalition asked the Supreme Court to halt the Trump administration's construction of this border wall while legal challenges proceed through the courts so that all of this damage does not continue to be wrought on the landscape um, when in the end um, this, this money has been taken illegally. So um, send your offerings up to the, to the gods of justice in hopes that we get this construction stopped in short order and that we can reinstate the rule of law. 
So that's it for me with, with bad and some good news. Um, I'm going to introduce Emily Burns now to walk you through a wildlife study. Emily is the program, our, our program director here at Sky Island Alliance. And she is, has been the principal architect of this project and is lead scientist on it. Um, she's done an amazing amount of work these last months, um, both to get this study out on the ground amidst the pandemic and then to pull these findings together. So we're really happy to be contributing to, to um, this work with the science. So with that, I'll pass it to Emily. Thanks, Louise. The first time that I stood next to the border wall, it was in Coronado National Memorial, what you see before you. And I remember standing there on National Park Service land and looking at this wall and trying to imagine what the new wall was gonna look like. This older section of wall was built with flood gate that could go up to let monsoon water flow through. You can see those in the bottom left of the photograph. And it's only about 18 feet tall. The new wall is gonna be 30 feet tall. And I remember thinking, how could this be? And why is this happening? <laughs> I also noticed all around on the dirt road, the border road that's used for patrolling this area, the signs and tracks of animals. We saw Sonoran desert toad. We saw many species of bird. Havelina. And in fact, we saw Havelina footprints all the way up underneath the border wall. Now, larger animals like Havelina get may get attracted to the wall, but they can't go through it, even in the section where floodgates open. And it just struck me how many animals are st stopped in their tracks by the border wall. But what gave me a tremendous amount of hope was looking towards the far end looking west where you see the end of the wall. You can see the end of the wall and the end of the border road. And you can see the open mountain in the distance. Now, how many animal species are, are walking across that pathway between Mexico to the south on our left of your screen and the US on the right? These rugged mountain corridors are so important for animals to be able to move around to find water, food, shelter and mates. There are many large mammal species that move between mountains within our Sky Island region, moving from mountain chain to mountain chain. And the border wall, when it goes completely through this area, is going to section off and separate Sky Islands right in the heart of this range. Our research is focused on identifying what the wildlife community is that depends on these mountains and these open corridors today. We wanna ask the question, which species are present in this landscape? We want to document them so that we can share this information quickly with the public about which animals are at risk from this major habitat fragmentation event. We also wanna use these data as a baseline so that we can study these species going forward if and when the wall is constructed in this region. We need to understand the ranges of species today so that we can help plan their conservation for the future and advocate for where we need to remove sections of wall first in order to restore these important wildlife corridors. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about four different things. As you've heard already this morning, we are talking about the US-Mexico border, and it is the transect that our entire research study is along in both the US and Mexico. I'm going to talk to you about how we designed our camera array when Sky Island Alliance decided we had to do something about the border wall construction concerns, we turned to community science and came together to design a rigorous scientific study using cameras to collect evidence that the US government has not been collecting prior to this construction project. And we will discuss the 1.6 million photographs that we've collected in the project over the last three months and specifically how we identify the photographs that have animals in them, how we identify them, and how you can help us with that going forward. And lastly, we'll conclude with some simple actions that all of us can take to help stand up for wildlife and help to protect the border and the amazing habitat found in Southern Arizona and Northern Mexico. 
And I want to say none of this would be possible without our Sky Island Alliance volunteers, our partners, Patagonia Area Resource Alliance, and Naturalia. Um, all of these folks are giving their time and energy to check cameras, assist with this critical data, um, this critical data collection and analysis, and they're helping us communicate what we're finding quickly um, to the public. So thank you so much to all of you. And also thank you to our funders, the Wilberforce Foundation, New York Community Trust, Patagonia Foundation, Papoose Foundation, and many individual donors that have helped us buy the cameras, pay for our staff to get to the fields and do all of the analytical work. So here we are, this beautiful photograph from the Southern Huachuca Mountains, and you look out at this landscape, and it's hard to imagine st stood in one place how to assess which species are here, which animals are walking by, which birds are flying by. But fortunately, there are methods that are designed exactly to answer this question, what is the wildlife community in this landscape? Specifically, our landscape is in southeastern Arizona and northern Mexico. In this map, you can see the different sections of border wall as they stand today. The existing stretches of border wall are in dark gray here, and they flank both sides of our study zone. The red dashed line along the border means that border wall is planned, but construction has not quite started. The imminent construction that's ongoing now in the Huachuca Mountains is here that Louise described. Our study cameras are primarily established on the US side, though we have recently been able to establish cameras on the Sonoran side, which is really exciting with the help of Naturalia. So what does that landscape look like with the wall coming in from both sides of our study zone? In partnership with Lighthawk, we have these great aerial photographs that show what the border wall looked like as of May on the eastern side of the study site. And this is the Huachuca Mountains, the photos I just showed you a few slides ago. And here it is from the western side. This is the western side of the Patagonia Mountains. And you can see, again, border wall and border road running, and then it stops. And then there's rugged, open landscape where many animals are moving back and forth between all those mountains you can see in the distance in Mexico and our beautiful sky islands here in Arizona. We followed the team terrestrial vertebrate monitoring protocol, which is designed specifically to document a wildlife community over a large spatial scale. Here's an example of how cameras get arranged according to the team protocol. A one kilometer by one kilometer grid is placed over the landscape and you do this in a map program back in the office. You put that across the place where you wanna study your wildlife community. And then we put our cameras in every other grid cell. So all of our cameras are located within three kilometers north or south of the border and within two kilometers of one another, and they're arranged in this off-cell off grid pattern. We modified the team protocol slightly by breaking our array of 56, uh, we have 58 camera points um, into smaller blocks because we were interspersing between private land holdings. All of our cameras are on public land in the US. Blocks 10 and 11 are in Coronado National Forest in the Patagonia Mountains. Block 12 is in the San Rafael Valley. It's state park land. 13, 14, and 15 are in the Huachuca Mountain foothills, part, also part of Coronado National Forest. And block 16 is our new camera locations at Rancho Los Fresnos, a TNC reserve managed by Naturalia. The beauty of the camera design that we have done is it allows a completely unbiased placement of our cameras. That means that because the camera locations were systematically chosen across the grid, it didn't require a wildlife biologist to think they know where the next bear is gonna be. It, they are almost randomly placed across the landscape, meaning that we're capturing more of the habitat heritage heterogeneity, excuse me, um, or the variation in habitat types across this region. The photograph that I'm showing you is taken from uh, Coronado Peak, which is in the Huachuca Mountains. So looking west along our study zone, stretching out towards the Patagonia Mountains. And the white shape you see, this polygon represents the area where our cameras are. And so dotted across this landscape are these random points 
where our cameras have been placed. And they span oak woodland into grassland. Another perspective of how the cameras are arranged is he, in this graphic from Google Earth. You can see the international boundary in the red line on the upper left hand side of the, of the map. And then the yellow points are where our cameras are. And you can see the collections, the aggregates of these cameras in these blocks and get a sense of scale between the cameras. It's a two kilometer stretch from each of those camera points. Here's what our cameras look like inconspicuously out there in the field. Many of them are strapped to oak trees and the beautiful Mandarin oak evergreen woodlands. Um, Sometimes we used other vegetation when we weren't in the oak forest. Here's a camera that our wildlife specialist, Megan Bethel, is attached to the remnant of a sotol stalk. And in other cases, if we were in completely open grassland, they're on a simple rebar stake. Now these cameras are very sensitive and they started taking pictures immediately once they were deployed. You can see, if you go back here, we can see that there is this amazing um, rainstorm that was captured. The winds coming through the San Rafael Valley make the grasses wave. We have a lot of pictures of dancing, of dancing grass. This is a really interesting photo of some extreme weather. Oops, excuse me, go back. Um, a nice hailstorm that was caught on our cameras. We've seen riders, um, horseback riders going through um, many of the areas and many, many cattle. <laughs> the cattle are quite hilarious. This one, this cat, these cows come by, they rub their faces on our cameras sometimes and they actually do occasionally knock them off. Sometimes that's pretty frustrating of course, but occasionally we get these lovely photos like this one of the sky, which is pretty funny. So once we take out all of the photos that don't actually have wildlife images in them, we're able to get down to just the nugget of the wildlife detections. And I'm gonna mostly talk about those going forward. But I wanna share one specific thing that happened on the landscape that I think illustrates how this sort of camera monitoring can help us understand a wildlife community when a disturbance happens and we can look at what happens to the wildlife community after the disturbance. In this case, it's a very small scale example, nothing like the border wall, but a lightning caused grass fire did break out in the San Rafael Valley. This happened um, at the very end of May and one of our cameras did take pictures of the fire as it was burning across the landscape, but this particular camera was unharmed. However, in the trees in the distance, that was a riparian area right where the Santa Cruz River is, and there was a camera that actually was in the line of the burn. And this is a, a photo that was taken of a doe in the few days leading up before the fire came. And then we saw this amazing sequence of photographs as the fire came closer, burned through the grassland, coming towards this particular camera. Now this was a relatively low intensity fire, meaning it didn't completely destroy everything about the camera. The camera melted, but the data, <laughs> the memory card was safe, which was such a relief for us, which meant that we were able to see the fire approach. Within a few days, we had replaced the camera and that's where the really interesting part happened for us is we were able to see the return of many animal species almost immediately back to the zone after the fire burned. 400 acres approximately were burned by this fire. And so animals living in and around this region started to walk through the, the burn zone right away. At the time this fire happened right on the border, the Bighorn Fire had started in the Catalina Mountains north of Tucson. And while that fire was so much dramatically larger in scale and scope, it was really hopeful for us to start getting these pictures back from our field site further south to seeing that animals, animals can come back into a burned area so quickly. Gila woodpecker, we have skunk, coyote chasing its next meal. Down in the bottom right hand corner, a lizard, got a bobcat up at the top right hand corner. Raccoon, maybe an owl or a night jar swooping through at night. This cute curved build thrasher on the bottom, the bottom right. And then up at top, another deer. So this is just a selection of the animals that we were able to witness on these cameras immediately following the fire. So what this tiny example says is, is 
that if we establish which, which animal species are present throughout the entire region prior to border wall construction, we will understand that baseline and then we can monitor for those changes in this wildlife community if and when that border wall is built and cuts through this ecosystem. Okay, so we started with 1.6 million photographs, which is a tremendous amount. Those had to be filtered out to remove the false positive images that were vegetation moving in the wind, maybe interesting weather shots. Um, any human observations of border patrol or horseback riders, those get stripped out, the cattle, any domesticated animals were removed, and then we're left with our wildlife species. We have done a first pass at analyzing what species are present in this wildlife detect detection set of photographs, and I'm gonna walk you through our findings. Now, these are all preliminary because we need additional help corroborating our identifications. Not all of these animals have posed perfectly for the cameras. In some cases, we just see a part of an animal or it's a little bit of a blur. So we're gonna gather as much expertise from our colleagues and volunteers um, to understand and make our best um, assessment of our final species list. This is a work in progress and we expect actually this number to go up even for the first 90 days once we get a few more species identified and we look forward to having your help on that. Okay, so here's the first result that I wanna show you beyond just the total species number of 71, which has really blown our socks off. It's much higher than we were expecting in just the short amount of time. This is a species accumulation curve, which simply plots the number of species that are detected for the first time in our study zone um, against the days the cameras have been running. So if starting on day zero, when the cameras first turned on, we see this huge jump up in the number of species. Almost every day there were new species being detected for the first time. And after a species is detected, it doesn't count again in this type of curve. Over time, we see that the pace slows down a little bit and then it tapers off even more which means that within 60 days of the study for this region, we had collected a tremendous amount, we think, of the wildlife community diversity. So we're gonna to continue to monitor, and, but as time goes on, it's gonna tick up when we start to see rarer species, because most of the common species at this point have probably been captured by our cameras. Now we've only measured in the spring, and it could be that as animals are migrating through, we're gonna pick up different ones. So we're gonna watch the shape of this curve really closely. And I know talking about flattening of a curve during COVID is, <laughs> is probably, it hits a little too close to home and I understand, but as scientists, we're really fascinated to understand what is the shape of the species accumulate, accumulation curve and have we truly established our baseline yet for which species occur in this area. The other thing we can do is we can take each smaller group of cameras and look at their unique species accumulation curve or the rate at which new species were detected on cameras in that place. What you're seeing here, the different colors represent the blocks and they correspond to the, the map segment I have at the top here. Um, the smaller pink line, this curve down here, are cameras that were established later in Mexico at the Rancho Los Fresnos. Um, um, preserves. So that's a place it started later in the study and that's why it's starting over here and the species are still accumulating and we're going to be analyzing more data. I think in the end they will have caught up to our other um, to our other camera locations but they just got a later start which is why their species numbers are lower. Um, the other thing that I would note that the one that so far has the most number of species this block 11 this is the east side of the Patagonia mountains this is incredible oak woodland forest, really rugged terrain. This is some of the best wild mountain habitat that we have in Southern Arizona where the border wall has not been built. The other way we can look at these species accumulation curves is by aggregating more closely related animals together and looking at the target of our study originally, which were the mammals, larger mammals. That curve is in blue. And the, you can see that the blue curve, we saw a lot of these species right away within the first month of the, of the study. And then very slowly and over the next two months, we, we added a few extras. But really after day 60, we haven't seen a new mammal yet. As our cameras continue to detect, 
we're hoping to get the, the more rare species um, if they wander through our camera locations. But remember, the field of view from our cameras is only about 100 feet from each camera with a field of view of 41 degrees. So it's a very small fraction of the entire landscape that's being subsampled by our cameras. So it's gonna take time for, for a, a rare species to actually wander by. We're gonna keep our eyes out looking for the spotted cats. We know this is jaguar and ocelot territory and we hope to find one on our cameras soon. So the, the mammal pattern is different from what we've observed in birds. Now birds have been the biggest surprise of the study. We weren't expecting to detect as many birds as we have. Uh, we have close to 40 species of birds already, and that curve is not flattening in the same way that the mammals are. We're continuing to see more and more. And as we move into the monsoon season, we're expecting to continue to detect more and more bird species. This is a place where we need the most help with our species identification. Sometimes we just get little tail feathers or the tip of a wing, and we need bird experts who really know every angle of some of these species to help us get uh, confirm identifications for the new, the new feathered friends that are popping up here. We also threw insects onto this curve. Insects were definitely not the focus of the study. Cameras are not typically how you measure for the diversity of insects in a community, um, but they have shown up time and time again on our cameras and they're not accidental triggers. They actually are triggering our cameras, so we included them. And I think uh, when we get some invertebrate folks working with us, we can, we're going to realize we have many species of butterflies. There are many types of bees and it's, it's really fun. And I'll show you some photos of those in a few minutes. But first let's talk about the focus of our study, which is really these large mammals. The large mammals that are so common and so fabulous here in the Sky Island region. Our Sky Islands have the most species of mammals anywhere in North America, and they're moving through. We have temperate species mixing with tropical species in the Sky Islands. And so it's been really fun to see exactly which ones we're detecting in spring this year. Of course, mountain lion, we have to start with mountain lion. This gorgeous large cat needs wide open territories. The males especially need a lot of space. Um, and so we, they need to have mountain ranges that are open and accessible for them to spread out among. The map on the right shows the territory, the range of mountain lion, and the red line going across North America here is where the 2000 mile long border wall is going. So for each of these animals I'm going to show you, I will have the map, I will have the border line there, and I just ask you to reflect on what is this continental scale uh, experiment going to do for populations of these species when they're completely cut in half. And in this case, there's going to be a northern North America population of mountain lions that will be completely separated from Central America and Southern America, South America. We've had three detections of mountain lions and they're present in both the Huachuca Mountains and the Patagonia Mountains. Okay, the smaller cat in our study, bobcat, love the bobcats. We've had a large number of bobcats, 27 pop, popping up, and they've been present um, throughout the whole U.S. side so far of our study, both mountain ranges and in the San Rafael Valley. Switching over to canines, coyotes have been so common. We've seen them in many places. We've also detected um, the um, the coyotes in Mexico. I'll show you a, a photo in, the, in a moment, but they're really interesting because I think if, I, if we share these data again in a couple years, the range map will really have changed for coyote. They're very much pushing down south in, um, into South America. So while they are sort of your, your classic North American canine species, they are on the move south, but once the border wall has, has been finished, um, that population will be separated and we'll, we're going to see potentially speciation for coyote um, along along this the length of the continent okay and here's the one of the first pictures we had from the mexican side of our study from rancho los fresnos this beautiful coyote with the huachuca mountains in the backdrop at twilight another canine species the gray fox it's also very, it's also very common in North America, but it also lives all the way down through Central America and into 
the northern end of South America. We've had a lot of detections of gray fox and we were really excited to see some, some young of the year, some small foxes on our cameras as well. Black bear, we love our black bear. We all really love this photo. We were really excited when we saw it. <laughs> Here are the bears. We had been waiting to see the first images of bears as they become more active as the temperatures increase in the spring. Um, and this was the first one we saw. This photo is from the Huachuca Mountains, but black bear has also now been, been seen in the Patagonia Mountains. The map I'm showing you on the right in red is where uh, black bear is thought to have been gone extinct or extirpated in that location. And I'm gonna zoom into our region. And you can see more closely um, here, the pockets of yellow where we have existing populations of black bear. In this case, blue is the line of the border. And we're very concerned about the ability of bear populations where they do have a stronghold to be able to repopulate areas um, once the border wall cuts through. Um, the connection between bears in Mexico and the U.S. are incredibly important. We've seen bear uh, tracks and their fur on the border fence, the actual um, wire fence. They are crossing back and forth all of the time, and that opportunity is going to close if the wall is built. Uh, another one of my favorite mammals, the American badger. We've seen two observations of badger. They've both been in the Huachuca Mountains. Um, and this is a classic North American species and they go down into Mexico, as you can see in the map and even in Baja. In case you can't see that badger very well, I just had to go ahead and show you my resident badger. <laughs> I have a badger at my house that loves to come and lay on her back in a water bowl. So they're quite charming, wonderful creatures and I sure wanna make sure they have continued access throughout to habitat throughout um, North America. Raccoon, a very common animal throughout North America into Central America. We've had 15 observations of raccoon and they are present on the entire U.S. portion of our camera site so far. A relative, the ring tail, beautiful image. We've only had this one photo, this one detection so far, and it was in the Huachuca Mountains. This nocturnal critter is really good at climbing trees um, and, is a, and it's an avid hunter. The white-nosed kawadi. Now this is a fabulous one. We've had 23 different detections of either single males or troops. A troop is a collection, it's a group of kawadi. Typically the females stay together with their young for a while and they move around in packs with their tails up. They're so, they're so wonderful. Um, this is really a, a tropical and subtropical species. And so the presence of Kawadi in Arizona, a portion of Southern New Mexico and in Texas is really the very Northern limit of, of their range. Now we have reports that Kawadi are pushing further North, which is promising. Um, this is a species that's gonna continue to be, habitats are always shifting in response to many factors that are going on in the landscape. And in the era of climate change, these species, Kawadi and others, need opportunities to move and to different latitudes to find climate and habitat that's suitable for them. And that makes something like the disturbance and, and the fragmentation caused by the border wall um, even more concerning for species like this when they lose their ability to migrate. We have three species of skunk, the striped skunk, the hooded skunk, the hooded skunk is more of a tropical species. Again, this is one of those species like the kawadi that's most common south of the border and we have just the northern end of the range here in the southwest. And then the American hognose skunk. We've had 11 sightings of this cute one. Um, like the hooded skunk, more of its population is in Mexico. Um, but we do have populations in the United States moving up all the way into Colorado. This was another staff favorite when we got pronghorn. We got our first detections of pronghorn on, on Sky Island Alliance cameras through this project. We've had seven detections of pronghorn and they've all been in the San Rafael Valley. Now this is a species that does not, um, has trouble passing through barbed wire fence. And so you can imagine that they will be completely stopped and blocked by the 30-foot steel border wall. Mule deer. 
really common throughout North America. The southern end of its range is in the borderland area. And then white-tailed deer, which are common throughout the Americas, including um, the western side and northern end of South America. And these are the most common species of mammal that we've had on our cameras, ringing in at 573 detections in each section of our border study. Here's the, one of the first pictures of white-tailed deer that we had from the Sonoran side at Rancho Los Fresnos. Another hoofed animal, the javelina, this is a tropical species, um, the collared peccary, it's also known as, that lives um, throughout South America, Central America, and then in Mexico, hugs the coast and comes up into the U.S. Now this species is so iconic here for us um, in the U.S. and, and we want to keep them connected to their, their relatives further south. Okay, we have three species of rabbits. There are lagomorphs. We have black-tailed jackrabbit, antelope jackrabbit, jackrabbit, which has a much smaller limited distribution in Western Mexico and in our U.S. area of the Sky Islands, and then the desert cottontail. We had Arizona gray squirrel. This is a very um, interesting animal with a limited distribution in the Sky Islands. You can see there's th basically three areas um, from and north of Phoenix, east into the Gila National Forest in New Mexico, a, a population just north of Tucson, and then a borderland population that goes down through the Sky Islands. Um, this is a species that would be highly fragmented um, with the border wall. And then the other squirrel that we've detected so far is the rock squirrel. It has a larger distribution than the one I was just talking about, um, and the border wall would just go right through the middle of its population. So all, all of those animals that I've talked about to you just now and showed you their photographs and their ranges, we've looked, stepped back and look at how many detections we have of these species. This isn't the same as the number of individuals, but it's how many times an animal of this species has shown up on our cameras um, every 30 minutes. If we see the same photo of the same animal um, in front of a camera, we don't count those unless they're spaced 30 minutes apart because sometimes a, an animal does just hang out in front of our cameras. So, we, we have independent detections. We set that at a 30 minute limit. And you can see here on the right hand side, this bright pink, yep, that's our white tailed deer, definitely our most common. And then here in the middle, it's our bobcat, coati, um, cottontail, and gray fox, our next most commonly detected species. Okay, returning now back to the species accumulation curve. We just talked about the mammals and how we had seen most of them by day 60 uh, of the study so far, but we know we're gonna continue to see more of the rarer ones as time ticks on. The birds on the other hand have had a very different type of a species accumulation curve. We've been steadily seeing birds as they go along um, every day of the study over the last few months, which has been really exciting. Um, so I wanna show you a little bit about the birds. Here's just a, a highlight reel of just some of the fun, candid photos we've had of birds. Well, sometimes they're very small specks or we only see a very fra small fragment of their tail feathers or wing tips or something. Sometimes we have a really wonderful perspective of the whole bird. We love this meadow lark flying for our camera right in the San Rafael Valley. These are Mexican jays. And the loggerhead shrikes are so interesting. I've got to know them better through this project because they leave us presents. They go hunting and they take beetles or small lizards and they stick them on spikes of sticks. They're actually using the border barbed wire fence um, to hold on to their food, their prey items, which is pretty interesting. I wanna just share a little bit about two interesting uh, birds that we have detected on our study, one being the gray hawk. This is a Central American into North American species. You can see its distribution on the map. Um, what's interesting is that these birds, their populations around the borderlands and here in Southern Arizona really are breeding populations that uh, come up into this area. 
So it's been interesting. We've had one detection of Greyhawk and that was, let's see, Greyhawk was in the Patagonia mountains. And then, and this is probably my favorite animal that we found, uh, we've had 12 detections of elf owls and they've been seen in both mountain ranges, the Huachuca Mountains, the Patagonia Mountains, and the San Rafael, San Rafael Valley in between. This is the world's smallest owl. Um, and like other small owls, it's possible that they will not fly over the new border fence. They are um, hesitant to fly up very high. They might be deterred by the lighting that might go onto the fence, the border wall. So we're very concerned about the impact that the border wall will have on breeding populations that fly northwards um, to nest during this time of year in spring and summer. And then during the winter, they return and they fly to Mexico where it's a little bit warmer. So we really excited to see these birds on their migratory route um, during the study so far. And we really want to protect their migratory corridors uh, by not having the wall built in this region. Okay, and lastly, we did include the insects. Um, the insects are really interesting. These insects are actually, they are triggering our cameras. Most passive infrared cameras won't respond to something small like an insect, but actually ours uh, are triggered by either motion or heat. And in this case, they're being triggered by the insects. And um, Many of them are yet to be identified, so the species number is not at all accurate. And cameras is not typically how you measure the diversity of insects. There are many other better techniques for doing that. But because they were picked up on our cameras, um, we did want to show you what we're finding. We've seen multiple species of butterfly, moths in the evening. We do not know what this insect is at the bottom center photograph. It looks like a whirling <laughs> blob going by. Um, carpenter bees other native bees. It's been really exciting to see them pop up on the camera as well. Now insects like this you might think oh well the border wall is not going to affect them. They can just fly over or fly through um, the bollards, the steel bollards in the wall. But one of the one of the things we are concerned about is water is being drained out of local water sources to make the concrete uh, to build the wall. So insects in particular, and then the animals that depend on eating insects are gonna be affected by cyanicas, our wetlands in the borderland region and springs drying up because of the tremendous amount of water that's being pumped out of the ground to build this wall. So that's sort of a lesser known issue of concern for even small insects like this, that the border wall, um, the impacts that it can have on, on species like this. Okay, and then the last taxonomic group that we found um, have been a bunch of lizards. Lizards are popping up as well. Again, like the invertebrates, often these are not typically picked up by passive infrared cameras, but ours are picking up um, reptiles. Reptiles have the same heat signature as the surrounding environment, um, but they're still moving and when they move, they are triggering our cameras. So we'd love to work with some herpetologists to figure out exactly what lizards are, are popping up on the cameras throughout this region. Okay, so speaking of getting involved with the project, one of the ways you can help us um, is by logging on to zooniverse.org and helping us either offer a new ID for one of our wildlife photos or helping to corroborate and agree with our assessment of what the of what the animal is. Um, we want to make sure that all of our observations are research grade so that this is evidence that we can clearly use as we're planning for these species future for conservation actions. And you can help us by going through the thousands of wildlife detections um, on Zooniverse. So the way these projects are set up, we have one unique project set up just with the mammals, and then we have another one for birds. Border Mammal Study has um, the mammals, and then I'm going to show you a little bit more about the Border Bird Study, but they operate much the same way. When you log in, and you'll have an opportunity to um, take a tutorial and it will explain to you how this identification process works. You can click through that and you can see the tab that will bring up a tutorial for you. Then once you're on a task, you'll be shown different photographs and you'll be asked a series of questions. You'll be asked first to identify, pick from our species list what species you think it is. If you don't see an animal in the photograph, which happens to me, um, sometimes the animal is too small or just camouflaged, I can't see it, you have an option to say I don't see an animal in this one. But once you're able to determine your best assessment of what the species is, 
there'll be a series of other questions. How many individuals of that animal are you seeing? What behaviors do you see? Flying, walking, standing, eating? Um, and are there any young present? We're interested to know if they have any um, reproducing um, organisms on our cameras. Uh, and if you need help identifying which species you're looking at, as certainly we all are <laughs> going to need a little bit of help, um, there is a field guide that can pop out. And we have images and descriptions, especially for, close, for, or for animals that look very similar to other species. And so you can explore that. And it's a great way to get to know the wildlife community in our region. We'll be updating this with new photographs as they come in from the field. So there should always be some for you to be able to click through and help us um, confirm or offer new IDs. And as we identify new species, we'll be updating our field guide as well as we go along. So all of the data that we're collecting that come out of the field from our cameras, we filter out all the blanks, we get our whittled down collection of photos that actually have wildlife in them, we confirm the ID. All of these data are going to be used to establish the wildlife community clearly before the wall is built and then monitor the, the presence of these species in this habitat if and when the wall is actually built. Our goal is to share all of this data with the public as soon as possible um, and Every little bit that you do, either going with our staff to help check cameras in the field if you're interested in that, or um, helping us with Zooniverse is gonna help make sure that we have research grade data that we can use um, as we work to protect these important wildlife corridors of the region. Okay, so to wrap up, um, I just would encourage you um, if you're if you're concerned about the wall as we are, that you call your senators. On our website, you can find um, a call script and numbers for you to call your senators and ask them to immediately stop the wall. We don't want new sections of the wall to be funded. We need to stop the construction and we need to make a plan to remove the wall and restore the habitat as soon as possible. If you have the means and are inspired, please do help us support this research um, by sponsoring a camera. That information is on our website. And again, you can visit Zooniverse um, and help us identify species. Lastly, spread the word, even if you just tell a few other people um, about the issues in the borderlands and these natural resource impacts that the wall is gonna have. It's gonna raise our cultural awareness and hopefully really get a movement going to demand no wall at our southern border. If folks didn't notice, I did paste um, links into the chat window that hopefully you can see for all of these actions that Emily has, has put forward for people to take. We appreciate you joining us in keeping these wildlife safe and, and stopping this wall construction. Um, we've got some questions queued up. So um, I'll start with a really easy one to you, Emily. What about reptiles and amphibians? <laughs> um, well, um, nobody loves reptiles more than me, for sure. Um, our original vision for this project has been to not only have camera information, but to increase our understanding of the biodiversity in the region with other techniques. We know that to, un to know which bat species are there, we're going to need to put acoustic detectors out. We hope that when it's safe for us to gather groups that we can do um, bio blitzes and bring groups of experts out to help us survey this region um, with Ernest. Um, if you are an individual that is passionate about this and wants to come out to the field, we are doing social distancing, small groups um, in separate vehicles down to collect these data. So it is possible that we may be able to do some of that now, um, but we're, we're looking for safe ways to continue to expand our data collection for the project at this time. Great, thank you. And then one really quick, easy question. There was a question if we have a, scroll, a, a call script developed for calling our senators. Yes, if you follow that link, there's a nice uh, short call script and some information to make it super easy for you to make that phone call. Um, let's go to, uh, there were a few questions around the topic of taking down the wall and restoring the land. And so the question was framed as if the wall is determined to be illegal, can what has been built taken down and land restored? And you, you did touch on this. Um, do you want to add anything to that, Emily, in terms of um, how we can move forward? 
Right. Well, um, you know, one of the first principles of conservation biology is it's much better to keep what you have than try to restore it. And so we are worried about the landscape features and cultural sites um, throughout the borderlands that are going to be damaged and not repairable um, with the border well construction. They are doing microblasting in, that's what they call it, um, in the Huachuca Mountains, and that is a concern. That said, um, wildlife populations and the habitats that sustain them, many features can be restored over time. And I think the critical focus for us all to have and the vision to have is this wall can and should and will come down. And when that happens, we need to set about making sure that native plants are restored, water sources are restored, where cienegas and springs have been drained to make the concrete for this wall, we need to bring the water sources back and allow animals safe passage again between our two countries. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add to that that we, you know, the, the action we're asking you to take with senators and going forward, it's really important that we um, hold the federal government accountable and tell them this is what we want because they're, once it's, if it's deemed illegal, it can be taken down and we need to push that against the public and organizations. Um, let's see, how about, um, so somebody asked if uh, Jaguar, if we have photographed Jaguars in the US and I um, responded that we have not, but we have photographed Jaguars um, 30 miles south of the border at Rancho El Aribabi. And um, there have been Jaguars photographed in the last um, uh, four years here in Southern Arizona in the Huachuca Mountains and the Dos Cabeza and, and Chiricahua Mountains and also um, El Jefe in the Santa Rita's. And a follow on question to that was, um, how do we know if wildlife are actually moving north in, and um, how the border wall might affect that north-south movement? And I have some thoughts, but go ahead if you, if you want to. Go, go ahead and then I'll add on. Well, I, I would just start by saying the jaguars are a perfect example of, we know um, that when jaguars are showing up here in the U.S., almost for certain they're coming from Sonora where there's a known breeding population of jaguars. And um, as Emily described it, with these different ranges of species that are crisscrossing the border, um, we know that animals are moving around back and forth, north to south, um, to reach resources. And an interesting case is Actually, bear, black bears are, are far more endangered in Sonora than they are here in the U.S. And um, it's important for them to move south, actually, to maintain population health for them. Do you have other thoughts on, on that dynamic and how we know or what we need to think about, Emily? Um, I, I think... I think that, that I agree with all of that. And I think there are other groups that are, are working really hard to understand the connectivity and tracking individual um, species. Um, birds, for example, have, have GPS tags and you can see their migration going up and down these areas. So I think there are gonna be, it's species specific, um, but there, there are numerous ways where we can collect more information about where these species are moving. and. I know the technology will just keep getting better. And I know in Africa, they're using cameras now to identify lions by their whisker patterns. So at some point, <laughs> we'll be able to actually identify individuals on our cameras. We're just not at that point yet with, with species except for spotted cats. Okay, um, before I ask the next question, I just have to say that it's pouring rain outside my window, which is wonderful. It hasn't rained like this yet. <laughs> Um, so good news from Tucson, it's raining. Um, so there was a, a, a couple of questions about border security. Um, and well, if not a wall, then what? Um, and so I, I, I just want to start by saying that the places this wall is being built right now are on public lands in very remote areas where there's precious little um, going on. It's not really about security. This is about uh, Trump, you know, pushing this through and by any means possible uh, re leading up to his reelection. The places where, um, you know, security can really be focused to make a difference in terms of lots of people's concerns around um, drugs and other issues are ports of entry, which are known to be the, the primary places that, um, that that's happening. Did you want to add anything to that, Emily? 
Well, I think for those of you who haven't been down to this region, um, we go down there quite frequently. We see a constant presence of border patrol um, in the area, and I've never had any encounters with with folks that have made me feel uncomfortable. So, I mean, it's a this is a very wild and and beautiful beautiful place where it feels like the security risk is incredibly low. Right. Um, so um, somebody has asked if there's ways these findings can be translated into economic value. Um, I'm thinking about the people living in these areas. Um, I, I do want to say that, you know, the Arizona Trail, which is now <laughs> a, a large road, is going to be built nearly on top of it, and it's closed to public use as part of the, two, uh, the $21 billion outdoor industry here in Arizona, where people come here to spend time in these uh, protected national wildlife refuges and national parks. And um, it's important to remember that everything that's happening with these places being closed and uh, really destroyed in many cases with this border wall affects our economy here in Arizona. Did you, did you want to add anything to that? Mm -hmm. yeah, we're answering all the, all the questions. Let's see. Um, we had a wonderful comment about uh, somebody spotting um, lightning bugs in the Huachuca. So there was a question about border wall and light pollution. Yes, uh, well, we, we've been eager to understand what the wall construction design is actually going to be for this region, and we haven't received um, detailed schematics to know, but we understand that light, lighting in association with the wall construction is very likely, and lighting in this type of area would have a multitude of effects on the corridor of species that are moving. Birds migrate primarily at night and will be dramatically affected by lights running along the border. Um, certainly insects, um, like, like these insects mentioned, are affected, their mating is affected by artificial light. So it is a major concern. And not only will the wall construction repel species from the area, but then the ongoing surveillance of the presence of border patrol on new sections of road that they're building will be a constant noise, source of noise, uh, noise and light as well. Great, thank you. And then here's a, here's a great question for you, Emily. Which species were the most surprising to capture on camera or the most endangered or threatened? <laughs> um, well, we were really, really, as I mentioned, really excited about the bear. Mostly we just really loved that photo and we were waiting for them to show up because it was getting warmer and we we're thinking, where are the bears? Um, but for me personally, the, the elf owl is so symbolic of our borderlands and the need to be able to protect even flying habitat for flying animals that are small and may not fly over a big 30 foot a tall steel wall that's lit. Um, so for me, I think, I think we can look at the elf owl as a symbol of if we can protect nesting habitat and connectivity between Mexico and the US for elf owl, we are truly protecting our, our borderland species. Yeah, great, thank you. And then another favorite on staff uh, was the pronghorn with our wildlife specialist who spent many hours pouring through these photos. Another wonderful species. Yes. Um, let's see, one last question here uh, about if senators are working on legislation to stop the wall. Um, I guess I just want to say that what, you know, what really needs to happen in the long term is that the Real ID Act that has allowed all of these laws to be waived and this border wall construction to proceed without any kind of environmental analysis, you know, going through these special public lands that are natural treasures, destroying Native American sacred sites. Um, you know, we need those laws in place. They're the laws of this country. They're there to protect us in these special places and the people here. And um, that's what really needs to happen. I don't know that that's in process right now, but um, it needs to happen. And, you know, um, keep, we'll keep the eye on that prize so that we can get back to um, um, honoring our environmental laws here in this country and other many other laws that have been waived. Um, did you want to add anything to that? No, I'm good. Okay. Well, I think it's 1030 on the dot. So um, thank you everyone so much for joining us. And I want to say a really big thank you to Emily 
uh, for the presentation and just to the Skyline Alliance team who's really been doing work these last months to, to bring the story of these amazing uh, creatures forward so we can all see them and share that with, with the public and with our elected officials and continue to work to try to protect these special places. Um, stay tuned for our next coffee break. Um, we hope you can take some of these actions with us that we've shared today and join us in identifying wildlife, um, calling your senators. We'd love to have you support the border wildlife study if you're moved to do so. And um, we will keep you posted. I'm sure we'll be uh, putting out another update, um, maybe in another quarter after we catch our breath a bit. <laughs> in the fall, for sure. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. Take good care. Bye. Goodbye.